Certainly, yeah. Councillor McPherson. <laughs> Feel free. Is, is that your best side? <laughs> That's your best side. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, Peter, I understand that you were intending to do a, a summary or address some points and um, give us a bit of background um, process information. So, um, please proceed. Okay, um, thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> There's just a few, uh, I guess, general introductory comments. Uh, would like to make about the report and then I'd perhaps propose to go to the conclusion towards the back of the report and just try to summarise from that some of the key issues from the, the report, the detailed report itself. But just as, and, and it, of course I think the sensible thing, Your Worship, if there are questions would be to raise them as we go rather than to try to uh, come back to them later. Thank you. Um, just some introductory comments, and I, and I would like to perhaps just highlight the item one on page one, if I could, and the, the last paragraph there. Um, I think we appreciate that doing a review like this is, is actually quite a difficult exercise for councils and, and uh, for governance groups, management groups. Um, I, I guess we would like to commend council, uh, in a sense, for having the courage to go and get the review done and to try to understand... Uh, what you can learn from the experience with the V8 event. Uh, I think that was a sensible thing for Council to do and to take some learnings from. Um, if I could just go uh, over to item four on page three and, and briefly comment on uh, some of our process with the review. We, we have interviewed quite a large number of people in relation to this review and the appendix at the back of our report lists those people that we've interviewed. I think, I think we interviewed all current councillors. Yes, I think that's right. We certainly interviewed a few uh, former councillors as well, um, former Mayor Bob Simcock and so forth, and several former staff. Um, included amongst that group was Michael Redman, former Mayor and former Chief Executive for the Council. Um, there has been a little bit of public discussion, I guess, around the approach that we've taken to the review and, and perhaps an expression of concern by some as to whether they've had sufficient opportunity to comment on the report and, and to provide some response on some of the findings. And I'd just like to comment briefly there that uh, in respect of Mr Redman, uh, former Mayor and, and former Chief Executive, there have been a number of occasions where we have either offered the opportunity or provided the opportunity for Mr Redman to um, see the report and to understand our findings. Uh, I'd like to emphasise there that we originally uh, endeavoured to meet with Mr Redman, I, I think on the 17th of June. Um, at the end of the day, Mr Redman declined to meet with us. He had some concerns about access to documentation and at the time those concerns could not be resolved very simply or very easily. But in relation to that opportunity, we had provided Mr Edmund with a lot of documentation, and amongst that, the, there was a paper that we called an issues paper, which summarised some of the thoughts that we had at that time of potential issues with the, with the V8 event. Uh, now, that was about five months ago now, so I guess we would say there that Mr Edmund has had an opportunity over about five months to understand um, some of the key issues that have, have come out of this review. We did uh, manage, we resolved some issues in terms of access to documentation with Mr Redman and we did get to talk to him on the 8th of September. That was quite a bit later than we had hoped, but for that meeting, or prior to that meeting, we had provided Mr Redman with a copy of the draft report at that time. And at our meeting, which I think was quite a constructive meeting, um, Mr Edmund provided us with, a tw I think, a 22-page submission. Um, uh, in other words, his response to the draft report that we had provided. Subsequent to that, we had some correspondence with Mr Redman around certain matters, certain further conclusions that we were reaching on matters we'd discussed on the 8th of September. And then we provided Mr Edmund with a further copy of the report, I think on or about the 14th of October, 
we were asking for a quick response at that time because uh, we'd given him a substantial draft report at that earlier time for the 8th of September meeting. Um, Mr Evans' lawyers, I think at that time, felt that there wasn't sufficient time to respond and sought an additional week to, until Wednesday this week to respond. Uh, but on Wednesday, we did not receive um, what we call a, a, any kind of a substantive response to the issues. We did receive some correspondence from his lawyers, but not in relation to the uh, substantive issues in the report. Uh, the letter was a concern about the process, and that's why I've commented on the process now. Um, we've, uh, I think around that, uh, our feeling is that we, we wanted to give an opportunity to those people potentially affected by the report, and I say potentially, it doesn't mean that they are or they were, uh, but we wanted to give them an opportunity to uh, review the report and provide comments. Um, your former Mayor, uh, Mr Simcock, provided comments for us. Um, I think Mr Simcock has been helpful in terms of the responses he's provided and his willingness to be interviewed at an early stage in the process as well. Uh, we also extended that opportunity to Mr Bocock within the Council here simply because uh, there are some references in the report where quite fairly he needed to be given an opportunity to respond. Um, and Mr Marriott, former Chief Executive, who was here in the early days when the V8 event was committed, he also was willing to be interviewed, and we did, and he saw the draft report and provided some comments as well, which were very helpful. That, that's the background, I guess, in terms of the approach we've taken. We have seen a vast amount of documentation for this review. Um, I mean, our, our files in Wellington, I guess, are colossal, and it's taken a lot of effort. But we've got to remember here we're talking of an event that's been running now since late 2005 at least, if not a little bit earlier. So any organisation would inevitably collect a lot of documentation uh, around that, and, and this council certainly did. So uh, we've had a quite big exercise in terms of trying to collate that and understand um, what that's all about. Um, your legal advisers did see a draft copy of the report, uh, but their focus was really on, on a slightly different aspect and a very important one, in that there are some current contracts in place with V8 supercars, and there is an obligation on you as a council to respect some uh, confidentiality around commercial terms in those contracts. So... The focus, really, of your legal advisers was, was on those matters, and we, we quietly and carefully worked through our report. We, we received some helpful information from them about what was likely to be commercial and confidence. We were able to make some relatively simple, easy adjustments to the report to address that. So, in fact, very little uh, really changed in the report, just minor changes which uh, we think substantially addressed the obligations in terms of commercial and confidence. Um, on page five, I'd just like to be uh, quite clear about um, who we're referring to when we, we refer to various people, refer to various um, organisations. Where the report refers to council, we're ref referring to the elected represent the body of elected representatives, i.e. to yourselves. Um, but we need to remember here that there have been three councils through the term of this V8 event. And the council sitting here today is not the council that was sitting here in 2006. And I, I think there is a need for caution there, because as you read the report and you see, well, perhaps council could have looked at doing this or doing something else, I, I think you do have to just check yourself slightly and say, well, let's remember, we're not necessarily talking about the people sitting in the room, well, certainly not all of them sitting in the room today. We're not talking about the current council. Um, so understand that I think the, the, the timing of some of these things, if you really do want to uh, understand who may or may not have been here at the time. Um, there are a lot of references in the report to chief executives. There have been five through the course of the V8 event. Two of them were in acting roles, but uh, they were there in acting roles at um, somewhat critical points of the process. Not for long, but they were there. I'd, I'd have to say I don't think we saw 
much influence action or decision by those acting chief executives, but nevertheless, we need to fairly recognise that five of them were here through the course of the event. Um, and there were three mayors as well, and I, I think we have to remember that. So where we're preferred to mayor and where we're preferred to chief executive, we've tried to be reasonably clear about who we're referring to. Our, our preference usually with the courts is, not, is to try, if we can, to avoid specific reference to people, because it, I guess our feeling is that uh, you really need to focus on the issues and the things that you can perhaps do to improve things in the future rather than trying to focus on people. But that actually becomes quite difficult when you're talking about chief executives and mayors. And, and so there's a, a natural limitation there. Uh, we did talk to other staff. We're, we're, as far as we can, we haven't chosen not to talk or refer to individual staff or to individual councillors here. But as I say, it's hard to um, avoid that when you're talking about a chief executive or a mayor. What I'd like to uh, do then, if I can, Your Worship, is basically to go to the back of the report. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd perhaps like to pick up, if I could, is paragraph 1013 on page 50. Bottom of page 50. Um, we, we were in discussion uh, quite recently with the management team here and, and with Barry about... I mean, we were very conscious that there's another council got elected late last year. Um, you have a new chief executive as well, um, although he's, he's now been here since about April. Um, we were aware that some things were changing, but we'd, we'd had no specific uh, discussions around the, the scale, nature, size of those changes. But uh, quite recently we, we got to talk to them and, and sought a bit of advice from Barry and his team about some of the changes that had occurred in the council over the last nine months. And we've listed them there at the top of page 51 in the bullet points. I think we were actually rather surprised um, to find that the, the, the scale uh, and nature of some of those changes. Um, we think they're very good changes, and, and as it happens, um, we haven't gone to look at the detail of those, I'd have to say, but just in essence, a lot of those kinds of changes do correspond with some of the sorts of things that we have recommended in this report that you look at. So, and this had occurred without any real discussion between us, um, no sharing of notebooks or anything else. Um, I think that probably through the kinds of questions that we had been asking of various people, there was an increasing awareness that, oh, well, if you're asking a question, maybe that means there's a little bit of an issue. Now, um, it's only now that we're through the report that we've actually told you about some of those issues. But I think in raising the awareness, it has allowed the management team and yourselves to just reflect a bit on some things, and you've just gone ahead and you've made those changes. So we think that's a good thing. I did want to point that out because um, you've done that of your own accord, and I think that's a good thing. If I could now go to the overall conclusions, which start on page 51, um, and what I'm attempting to do here is to summarise about 40 pages of detailed findings. Uh, I think it's important to understand that there is a lot of detail in the detailed findings. Um, there are some, I can't repeat it all in a conclusion, but it's absolutely crucial that you do understand some of the detailed findings, the nuances of some of these issues, and the reasons why some of these things might have occurred. And, and at least to that extent, unfortunately, conclusions don't necessarily do justice to it all. But if I could start with the first bullet point. Um, we've we've endeavoured, as honestly as we could, to report what we've found. Um, we're conscious, I suppose, that um, not all of you, and possibly not necessarily Barry or all of the management team, will agree with everything uh, that we've got here. But what we've written is based on, I guess, a lot of our own experience in some areas. And we're conscious of the fact that some of what we've seen here in relation to the V8 event... Rod and I in particular, through our own experience with local government over many years, we have never seen that kind of thing in our own organisations 
or being particularly aware of it in others. So some of what we've observed here has been a surprise to us. Um, and, I, and I probably, unfortunately, mean surprise in a disappointing sense. There was some good news, though, and, and I'll come to that in a minute. In the first bullet point, I refer there to, um, and, and I think, uh, Your Worship, we, we are at the point if councillors want to ask questions as we go, then that's probably the, the sensible way to do it. But okay. with the first bullet point, uh, we referred here to what we believe really was a lack of caution, generally, by management and council in committing to the V8 race event in 2006. There was no objective assessment of the event opportunity, the kind of thing you might see happening through a full business case assessment. There was no business case prepared for it. Elements of the business case work were done, but it wasn't done in a comprehensive sense. A key element of a business case is a good cost estimate. The cost estimate used as a basis for committing to this event was very inadequate, quite poor and that became evident quite quickly later on. No due diligence was done of the proposed promoter. There was, uh, I think, some checking and some knowledge by the management team. They satisfied themselves to some extent that the promoters or the principals of the promoter did have experience with this kind of thing. And, and I think there's evidence in terms of Pukekohe events and other things that, yes, they did have some experience. But... Due diligence is a lot more than that, and in particular, financial due diligence. And you didn't have to dig too deeply with the promoter to find that there wasn't a lot of substance there financially. Well, look, I had a question, sorry, mm -hmm. that yep. point, that was due diligence on promotion to CSM. There was also a relationship, was there not, between CSM and V8 Supercars in Australia mm. and some sort of franchising agreement that they would be there no, it is in the body of the report, and I think it's probably one of those examples where um, the overall conclusions here are maybe a somewhat unfortunate summary of things, but we have indicated back in the body of the report uh, that very thing, that CSM, uh, as the promoter in New Zealand, was here, uh, was here on a sanctioned basis by V8 Supercars. And, and I think most would agree, and I guess the impression we got from the people we spoke to is that there actually was some confidence in V8 Supercars. And I think to some extent, the fact that they were present there somewhere did increase the confidence levels. But um, nevertheless, the right sorts of guarantees and undertakings to ensure that V8 supercars would be properly there to, to back things up unfortunately weren't quite put in place. Not, not the way perhaps some people thought or, or had understood they might have been. But around the whole question of the, uh, the financial status or state of um, health with CSM, for example, there's no indication that was very good right from the beginning. And... Um, so there was, clearly was a big risk there. And there's a lot in our report that really comes back to this concept of risk. Uh, were the risks understood and were the risks managed? And I think around some of those things there are some big questions. Any, any other questions on that point from councillors? Um, no? Okay, thank okay. you. Um, I think it's perhaps a, a little unfortunate that the V8 race event wasn't recognised as a seven-year project, in a sense. And the concept of that might be a little bit difficult to understand. I think there was a good understanding that there were seven races. And for each of the races, there were some good efforts made um, by Council or by Hamilton City Council as a whole to um, set up and facilitate and support each of those races that occurred. There were some very good efforts around that. But the concept of viewing it as a seven-year project might have seen some more robust approaches being taken to those project issues, project principles, project expectations, such as reporting, um, such as the way in which you fund or, or create a budget for the event, and trying to ensure that there are very clear arrangements in place 
for the funding, for the reporting, for the understanding of risk, for the management of risk, and so forth. Um, and I just think that got lost a little bit, or lost sight of. And as a consequence, some of the reporting and, and funding arrangements and other things were a bit disjointed around that. And, it, and it, I think it led to the difficulty that Council, at the, through those times, had in trying to understand the overall impact of this event, whether it was cost or whether it was risk. So we're just in, uh, look, I don't know that there'll be a similar kind of event again in the future, but who knows, there could be. And all we'd say is treat it as a whole event. Try to look at the opportunity to report just to a single committee or to council as a whole, rather than the separate reporting that existed across a range of committees. And that's not because the committees can't do a good job. I think it's just that it would be helpful for you to get that fuller, clearer picture with simplified approaches to reporting and, so, and funding and so forth. Yes, Councillor Gallagher, do you have a question on that? Yeah, just first of all, um, I know, but I think for the public information it's important. Could you, you were both chief executives. Could, could you say which local authorities you were chief executives of? I worked for, well, I'll let Rod speak for himself, yes. which is easiest, but I, I was Chief Executive of Manawatu Regional Council. Um, I was there for nine years, and in my early days, I was op second tier of operations, regional operations manager with the council. I am a civil engineer in terms of background, right. so my own experience is, uh, I'd say, uh, quite extensive in terms of um, uh, the Clyde Dam, for example, for nine years, and an underground railway project in London for five years, those kinds. I was the town clerk and chief executive of the Building Borough Council in the last years of years of <coughs> and uh, 20 years as chief executive of the District Council, retired two years ago. Coming to uh, the role of, say, an audit, you know, we have this situation of councillors. You, you talk about, you know, a small committee like the audit committee uh, or the contracts subcommittee, of which is, you know, the interface of elected members' management. In terms of uh, the ultimate account of, you know, accountability of governance, what were the basic things that, uh, in that, in councils that you run, what would have been the role of a contracts committee? What would be a reasonable degree of diligence that contracts committee members should have undertaken? Um, Councillor, you're referring to our experience from the past, or you're referring to the VA event? Well, the VA event relative to your relative, what you would have expected. <laughs> My, 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 so my, my question is around actually governance, not necessarily yeah. management, about yeah. the governance process, because that was what you say, that was the interface. Yes. I, perhaps the best way I could explain that is that if the V8 event had only been about building some track infrastructure for the first race, yeah. then you probably could have covered it quite comfortably with one of the committees and a budget to deal with that. And it comes back to the issue I raised earlier about recognising it as a seven-year project. Because it was a seven-year project that had spent over seven years um, and spent considerably more than just track infrastructure, it might have been useful to have reported it um, to perhaps council as a whole or a committee of the council as a whole or something like that. Um, it's, it's not that we've described that as essential, but... I think that there's a natural situation with reporting to committees that ultimately their, um, the decisions they make are ultimately endorsed by council, but by the time they are elevated to a full council, it's not necessarily with the same opportunity to discuss things, not necessarily with the same level of information and that kind of thing. Now, that's quite a normal council process, but all we're saying is if you'd recognised it as a seven-year seven project with the value that it had, maybe you, you could have looked at a different arrangement for the governance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councillor uh, In your report, we want to just sort of yes. to read it. You say that the contract with the V8 was not actually signed until 2008. Mm -hmm. so we had a slippage of two years. Um, that how you describe it? No, I wouldn't put it that way. Um, we have a concern about the late signing of the contract, but the first race event wasn't until April 2008. So you could argue, I suppose, that the contract was signed before the first race. The difficulty we had 
and it probably picks up a later bullet point, but that's fine. Um, the difficulty we had is that the council had spent more than $18 million before it signed a contract. Now, that is a huge risk. It's a business risk. It, we didn't see it as an authorisation issue. We saw it as a business risk because it left the council exposed. If the promoter had walked away and refused to sign the contract in February 2008, how would council have felt? How would it have seen that then? Now, you know, this, it's a risk thing. Was the risk high, low, or what? And, and I'm not sure we can quite judge that. But we did, our observation is that the promoter was not strong financially, and I suppose if it felt too concerned, it could have walked away. So we saw that, we saw that as very unwise and not something that really should have happened. What did council know about that? Well, council approved the contract back in October, and probably to a reasonable extent, it just assumed that then happened. And, of course, infrastructure got built and preparations were made for the first race. But in truth, it took another five or six months to sign the contract. Um, we do know that by about February 2008, Council was aware that the contract hadn't been signed. But for a period of four or five months, we didn't find evidence that Council was aware of that. So a lot of spending was going on and there was a risk with it. Thank you. So I just wanted to pick up the last bullet point of page 51. Um, I, I, I guess we appreciate the fact that there are some findings in the report here that are, that are probably some disappointment for people. But um, we did feel that the project that was set up to build all that track infrastructure to get the council ready for that first race was a well-run project. And, and I think it's a credit to those people that were involved in that. We, we were quite impressed. I mean, I, I know from my own background on projects, um, there's been some successes and other things that don't always work out right. That one worked well. And uh, they had to. They had to be ready for the first race. The resource consent, I think, was also, in our view, a well-managed process. And we do know that there's been a, a, maybe a, a little bit of consternation about um, some of the uh, agreements that were reached if you like, to one side around that. Um, we know that's not unusual for that kind of thing to happen in a resource consent process, so we don't take any particular position on that. I think we also understand, and, and I, I guess we are talking about pet practice in this instance, that the fact that the, the new promoter V8 supercars found itself for whatever reason unable to honour that side agreement wasn't something the council probably could have expected. It was a bit of a shock and, and probably a bit of a disappointment. But at the end of the day, it was a minor cost issue, and I and I'd really don't... It's a bit of a distraction here. I think the, the key things are that the project for the track infrastructure and the work done around the consent were great. So I'm on page 52, Your Worship. I've, I've kind of referred to this already in the top bullet point there. Um, the original cost estimate on which Council committed to the event was actually prepared by the promoter um, in January 2006. Um, that was quite inadequate, and that became apparent, I guess, soon after. Um, that would have been a big disappointment for the Council, and, and clearly uh, management would have been trying to work out what they could do about that. Um, I think management had identified some opportunities for revenues, and there, there were some expectations about that. I, I think the sad part of it is not all, those, not all of those revenues actually eventuated. But right from the early days, the V8 event was almost off on the wrong footing because the estimate wasn't very good and the commitment was made on the basis of that. Um, that's, I guess, pretty disappointing. And, and the sense we had is that there possibly was some inevitability at that point as to where the V8 event was going to go, but there wasn't a great recognition of that at the time. Um, for the track infrastructure to have increased in costs from about seven million to eighteen million is pretty significant. So uh, I think I've talked. Uh, about the next bullet point, about the fact that um, a lot of money was spent before the contract was signed with CSM. 
we don't think that was an acceptable um, action for, for a public sector organisation to take. Uh, private sector can do that. Um, they make their own calls. I think one of the, the distinctions here is the fact that this was a public sector organisation. Um, we, we're conscious we do a lot of work or, around New Zealand, I guess. Um, some of the things I'm talking about here are, are not unique to Hamilton City Council. I, I think you probably have to understand that too. From time to time, we do find instances where contracts aren't signed and money is spent. That doesn't make it right. Um, and, and we would just pick that issue up, kind of issue up, with any organisation where we might find it. In the next third bullet point down on page 52, um, we refer here to this total cost information and to information about CSM's financial difficulties. We, didn't, we, we reached a conclusion that information around that wasn't shared as well as it could have been. Now, why that happened is a bit hard to know. But I guess the end result of it is that there were, for a period of two years, council didn't receive what we would call a consolidated report of total costs. And, and I think that's very unfortunate. Um, I think council did know about a lot of the elements of cost at the end of the day, but you had to do some arithmetic yourselves to work out what that meant in terms of total costs. I'm also uh, conscious that there were some, there were things like some of the revenues, for example, that could have uh, potentially been accruing here. You wouldn't have had great knowledge of that. So I don't know that council was left in a great position to properly understand total costs. The couple of things it did know, and, and I think we need to note that, is that when the event was committed in 2006, um, council understood that there was seven million dollars in um, for infrastructure and it was a sum of money required for the host city fees. So there was quite a significant sum there that council, in essence, should have been aware of. Um, I think the passage of time has possibly left um, some people, and I'm not necessarily talking about people in this room, but has left some people uh, not accurately recalling what the cost of this was back at the beginning. And, and for example, uh, one or two people suggested to us that they thought the total cost was seven million. Well, the total cost was never seven million. It was significantly more than that by the time you added the host city fees. So it, we, we just want to recognise that. Excuse me. Yes, Councillor Voss. Um, you said that that we all knew that uh, the total cost uh, was more than seven million. Mm -hmm. But would you assume that we were going to also receive some income from the event, which may have made people think, well, if we take the income, um, we would um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, seven million, but it would be closer. There, there was a, I guess, the conclusion we reached. There was a real lack of clarity around information on that, and and it. it, it it's hard to determine now precisely what may have been known to council at that time and what was not. But what we observed is that some things weren't reported quite in the way that we might have expected. And I, I could probably understand that um, there wouldn't be a clear picture of that, particularly a clear picture of revenues. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll go on to talk uh, one, two, three. Perhaps I should have numbered these. The one, one, two, fourth bullet point down, uh, we refer there to steps that management took to assist um, the promoter with its financial difficulties. The promoter was having financial difficulties very quickly. The first race event was run at a loss. And, in fact, all the events ran at a loss. So, um, clearly, this was heading in the wrong direction. Uh, the promoter was struggling and was uh, having to make approaches to um, the council to get some support and assistance around those cash flow difficulties. So management did agree to make some advance payments, and uh, some advance payments were made. Um, management also agreed to defer some of the debt that existed around things like lease rentals and that kind of thing. Um, it's perhaps fine 
if those decisions are made, but I, I guess our concern out of it is that Council itself does not appear to have been properly advised of that. We couldn't find the evidence that Council was properly aware of those things. So I guess we concluded that Council wasn't properly aware of the financial difficulties that existed. My, I say Council because I'm talking about the whole group of elected representatives. Um, it is possible, one or two might have known, I have no idea, but um, through the formal reporting to Council, for example, and the kinds of documentary evidence we went looking for, we could not see how Council would have been um, particularly aware of, of these things. The next bullet point down, um, I, we have just recorded the, uh, um, our assessment of the total cost of the race events to um, December 2010. So I want to be clear that um, that is the date at which we have determined the cost. Um, since then, we've had another event, and uh, in truth, this will have shifted a little further. Um, the 37.4 million we refer to there is a little bit higher than the understanding you probably got in December last year. And the explanation for that is that uh, for some reason, not everything was reported to you in December last year. I think, I suspect there was an oversight there. There were one or two areas of cost. They weren't, they weren't great, but uh, perhaps of the order of a, a million or two million that weren't gathered up in that total cost summary. So we just wanted to give you the clearest picture we could of what we believe the current total cost was at December 2010. The, to the next bullet point refers to the total debt that CSM has with Hamilton City Council um, of nearly $3 million. Um, there are a number of aspects to this that uh, perhaps concerned us. Not all of that was even invoiced. Some of it wasn't advised to the liquidator in the liquidation process for CSM. Um, I don't know why, but I don't think that's a particularly satisfactory situation. The end result of it, though, is I think it's probably almost certain you have no hope of recovering that $3 million, given that uh, CSM and related companies are now in liquidation. Um, some of that debt related to advance payments that were made, including an advance payment of host city fees, and, and we felt that was particularly disappointing. Uh, that those advances have been made and um, $837,000 of those advances of host city fees weren't recovered, able to be recovered. So that's part of the debt. The next bullet point refers to the novation of the contract in uh, uh, really commencing with this council's decision in April 2010. Um, there you are. I, I caught myself out there. I said this council... The council that was in place in April 2010 made the decision to novate a contract. Um, but when it did that, it made the decision without knowledge of the total costs of the race event. Nor was there any revisiting of a business case or anything else. Um, we feel that that information should have been demanded. And I think at least to that extent, uh, we we'll probably encourage council in the future um, to probably demand that information. Um, there were one or two practical difficulties with it because at that time there was an April 2010 race event, for example. So it's possible, probable indeed, that uh, the cost information couldn't have been quite up to date. But um, look, Accountants and finance teams are pretty clever about bringing together the costs they know and giving you an indication of likely forecasts around the things that they don't quite know. So I think it, it would have been still quite possible for management to have given you a reasonably substantial indication of total cost. And it is purely conjecture now, but if you'd been aware that the cost was around 33 or 35 or 37 million, um, how would that council at the time have seen? Would it have seen something differently? I don't know. That's um, for others to consider. Um, the third to last bullet point um, from our review of information related to 21 April meeting, we did get the distinct. We could. We've reviewed the transcript 
of um, those meetings. And a large part of that meeting, of course, was in public excluded. So uh, I, I'm not intending to discuss the detail of that. But I think uh, Rod and I pretty clearly understood the dilemma that Council found itself in. Uh, we could see that from the questions being asked, from the responses being provided. Uh, I think Council was in a very difficult position at that time. It's unfortunate it didn't have some better information, but it probably at the end of the day didn't have too many choices about what it needed to do. So all I can do is record the fact that we've looked at the documentation, we've looked particularly at the transcript of the public excluded meeting, that is the kind of sense that we got that there was a bit of a crisis and Council had, didn't have too many choices at the time. Um, there was really only two, either you abandon the event or you continue, and they weren't easy choices. I think the difficulty was that it might have been helpful if Council at the time had had some slightly better information. At that meeting, second to last bullet point, Council agreed with management a set of principles to be applied to the new promoter contract. Now, those of you that were here at the time will recall, I suspect, those, uh, was it eight principles, I think, that were agreed, and there was an additional um, resolution of council related to um, communications, I think, or a media release or something like that. Uh, the expectation, and I think it was a clear enough one, was that management would then put in place a suite of agreements with both with V8 supercars and, and to some extent they needed to um, have some agreements in place with CSM in terms of the novation itself. Um, the expectation was that all of those agreements would have been consistent with the principles that were agreed with council. In our view, they weren't. And that was probably one of the um, biggest concerns we had in terms of the, the work that we were doing. And it drove us to try to understand exactly what had occurred uh, following that council meeting. Amongst a number of agreements that were put in place was a something called a compensation agreement. And it was through that compensation agreement that this council paid off the creditors, CSM's creditors, in a sum of approximately $3 million. We could not see how that agreement was consistent with the principles that Council agreed. We couldn't see it. We couldn't find it. We've received a lot of explanation from current and previous management as to what their interpretation was around that what they believed they had agreed with Council. Um, we've had explanations as to their interpretation of those resolutions and what they believed they were able to do in terms of their delegations. We're also conscious that at the time there were a certain number of informal discussions occurring, workshops between management and Council. Um, that's understandable because it was a crisis and things clearly needed to be discussed. But at the end of all of that, we simply couldn't see, we couldn't identify through formal resolutions, formal records and so forth, how the compensation payment had been properly authorised. We couldn't see it. Your Worship, I have a question on that matter. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask it now? Thank you, Your Worship. Could you tell me in your opinion, or did you see evidence of um, a united view from management as to their interpretation of what came out of that meeting? Or, or was there even some disagreement within management of what came out of the principles that you were referring to? Um, thanks, Councillor. That's not an easy question to answer. I, I think... We didn't get the sense that there was necessarily strong disagreement within management around that. We didn't get that sense. As part of our review and in terms of talking to people, um, I guess it's emerged that 
possibly there were some different views, but it's not really very apparent in anything else we saw. So it's probably difficult to uh, form a clear kind of conclusion on whether there was disagreement within management around this. Um, what we did kind of understand was that um, management appeared quite confident with its um, understanding, I guess its own understanding of what the resolutions and what the delegations all meant. Now, our conclusion though is that, well we don't agree that they had the right interpretation, but that's not to say that they mightn't have generally felt that was okay. We've said that um, we don't think there was proper authorisation there. And, and that really is a reference to, we went looking for the formal resolutions. We went looking for the formal documentation of understanding um, and the way in which resolutions have been converted into agreements. And our conclusion was we just simply didn't agree that that was right. Your Worship, just one further question on that matter. Is it, is it your determination, or do you see evidence of um, councillors feeling that uh, they thought that these creditors were to be paid by the V8, the new V8 organisation, as distinct from council funding that quantum? Well, all we could rely on were the, um, the transcript of the 21 April meeting, the officer's report that was submitted to that meeting, and some of the formal documentation around resolutions and the like. The only conclusion we were able to reach was that the intention was to pay the creditors, for Hamilton City Council, by one means or another, to pay CSM's creditors, but by way of an advance of monies to V8 supercars. In other words, it wasn't necessarily to be an additional new cost to the council, it was to be an advance or prepayment of some monies due later. That is the only clear understanding we could get from all the documentation we saw. Instead, what happened is that the $3 million payment was a new cost to council, and we saw that not being consistent with the resolutions that council reached. Um, we have not been able to conclude otherwise. Thank you. Councillor Gallagher. Yes, in terms of a learning experience, my understanding the 21st of April meeting was, was that unanimous in terms of the council agreeing? The novation? Yes. Uh, was there dissent? There, there were certainly one or two members that weren't present. Right, in the meeting, right, okay. Um, so it couldn't be uh, sure. said to be unanimous from that point of view. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't yeah, quite answer yeah. the question uh, from memory as to how many. I'm not sure whether we in, in terms of governance, and this is obviously a question that is meant to be very constructive, what questions would you have expected a governance team, in terms of the role of governance, to have actually asked at that meeting? What key questions? I mean, all right, you, to, you can talk about the reports from management, but in the end, buck stops with governance. What would you have expected? I guess the key things, and we, we have referred to it in the report, you needed a total cost report. You needed to make a decision with full knowledge of where costs had got to. Um, I think it's apparent to us that when that knowledge um, was obtained by council at a later time, most of those we spoke to were shocked. Now, um, it might have been better that they'd known about that back in April 2010. And as I said earlier, um, it is possible mm. to generate a report that identifies the costs you know and, and adds to that some forecast costs around some other things to give you a reasonably good picture of costs. So Council needed to ask for that cost information. It could have also, and we touched on it as well, um, asked for, in essence, a business case around it. Now, perhaps the reason I say that is that business cases, if, if they're done in the, in the fullest sense, include things like risk assessments. 
and there were a bunch of risks around the decision that council was having to make. Whether it was aware of them or not, they were there. And, and I think if there'd been a more comprehensive um, package of information put to council of, of, of a business case nature, cost information, some discussion, clear discussion about options, about risks and so forth. It, there's a set of questions, a set of information in there. Councillor Gow. Thank you. I'll leave it to later. Okay, Councillor Wilson. Oh, thank you. Your Worship, if I could just answer the, the question that was asked there. The motion was declared carried unanimously on voices, which was the 21 April meeting, for those members that were present. There were three absentees. Three absentees, thank you. Your Worship, uh, thank you. Just following on from a question of uh, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, you said earlier on that you have listened to the transcript of that meeting in April 2010. And I gleam from your report that there was uh, inadequate information presented. Do you recall from the transcript, was there a series of questions from elected members trying to glean what the total quantum had accumulated to? Was there an attempt to try to understand what they were having to make decisions on in terms of the overall amount of indebtedness? Um, thanks, Your Worship. The, the, perhaps the first um, brief comment I'll make is that we, we didn't listen to the tape, we read the transcript. Sorry. It's been transcribed. Um, Rob, can you comment on that? It's not a, I, I don't get a strong view of that at all, but why we're finishing mm. what we call transcript. There are certain parts um, where I think there were attempts to identify costs and who were meeting costs and who were costs before them, but I don't recall uh, specifically attempts to get forward. And obviously this is the area that you were concerned on, uh, clearly that those questions should have been asked mm -hmm. and, in theory, should have been answered. Yes, I, I, I think that's the feeling we had. But, but what we did see, um, I guess, through reading the transcript, um, it was a long meeting. Um, there was a lot of, an exchange, a lot of verbal exchanges um, between management and, and elected members, questions and so forth, trying to get an understanding of what this meant, where did this come from, um, what are we going to do going forward. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the resolutions that were proposed, but out of that we also saw some, um, some reasonably clear expectations on the, on the part of uh, the Council. And, and there were statements made, for example, that um, Council was agreeing a set of principles and I think it was the former Mayor made it clear that if there was any significant departure from that, they expected it to come back to Council. And there was some discussion between the Mayor at the time and one of the, 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 the members around that issue. So, generally speaking, Council did develop an understanding of what was going to happen in a number of different areas, but we believe also made it clear to management that if things were much different from that, you need to bring it back to us. And our concern was that we think some different things did happen, that they were reasonably significant, and we have not found evidence they went back to Council. Just one final question, if I may. I heard you say that um, you felt that at that meeting, what you would have felt was a minimum that should have been presented to Council was a, a more robust uh, plan I think you referred to somewhat of a SWOT analysis of risks and opportunities and threats. Uh, uh, I, I wonder if, in general, if that's not a minimum that should be presented to elected members of any significant decision presented to Council, if I could have your opinion on that. Well, I, um, I mean, you wish, I think I answered that question, I guess, in a, in a looking forward sense, which is actually quite important, because um, out of this whole V8 thing, uh, the only value, really, in looking at what's happened is um, 
what do you do going forward? What could you do better? What could you change? And I think that's where the value really lies. Um, we've, we've highlighted the fact that one of the key pieces of information missing for that meeting was the information on total costs. That, in our minds, was crucial. Um, all the more so when we saw, observed, whether it was through interviews or a later council meeting, the reaction from elected members when they did find out what the total costs were. So that was a, a serious omission, really, in terms of information there. But you go back then to what's a business case, and, and if you looked at the, um, the content of a typical business case, then they're, they're not necessarily a two-page document, not when you're spending 30 or $40 million. Um, and they really have quite a thorough discussion normally around risks, around options, around costs, around time. Um, uh, there could be um, legal implications. There could be a whole lot of things that would be discussed through that. Now, I do know you're working under some urgency, but even in that situation, there were, in our view, there was a need for much better information to be presented. Thank you. Another question? Carry on, thanks. In the um, fourth to last bullet point on page 53, uh, the compensation agreement and the, the question of whether that or not that had been properly authorised was certainly a concern for us through the uh, review. But there are a number of other changes also made um, through the agreements that were put in place as part of the novation that, it, that appeared to us as, as being quite inconsistent with discussions at the council meeting on the 21st of April. And one of them was the inclusion of this clawback provision. Now, we spoke to many of you through the review, and I'm conscious of the responses we got. And, and I'd have to just note there was a lot of surprise that this kind of a provision existed. Um, I know... If, Things have changed now because Council's made uh, a decision recently around the future of the event. Um, but that aside, if this event was going to continue on for another two, three, four or five years, this clawback provision that was included in those agreements is quite a significant issue. And as far as we can tell, that is at odds with what was agreed with Council on the 21st of April. It wasn't signalled in that sense. The clear understanding we see from the documentation is that V8 supercars would carry all losses. As simple as that. Um, the clawback provision, though, doesn't uh, result in that kind of situation. So we were probably concerned to see that appearing in those agreements. Um, the third to last bullet point, unless there was a question, is, is just look, it summarises a number of pages in this report about the adequacy of reporting by management to council. Um, I think our overall conclusion is we really don't think it was satisfactory for a project like this with the kinds of issues that were arising, uh, with the risks that needed to be managed, with the... Um, cash flow issues and the cost issues that were coming through with the debt and revenue situations that existed. We simply couldn't see any kind of comprehensive effort to making sure that Council was fully aware of those things. So in conclusion, we really don't think that that reporting has been adequate. Back in the body of the report, we, we also refer to, uh, we refer specifically to a number of things not reported to Council. I won't repeat those now, but they're back in the body of the, point, the report as bullet points. But we also refer to um, a couple of, I think they're both resolutions that Council agreed that came through officers' reports. Uh, one of them in particular, if I... Uh, could just find it and refer to it, because I think I will. Because um, I, I just think it's something you need to pick up going forward. Um, can you help me find the page, Rod? That resolution that we didn't like. Reporting. Uh, 
page 49, councillors. Um, I'll just pick up on the second bullet point on page 40, uh, under 10, 11, 3. The officer's report contained a recommendation, <coughs> excuse me, that council did actually agree to, that the event sponsorship fund will have a probable timing increase in the reverse carryover of future budgets to fund the transition and set up costs of V8 supercars. Well, we don't think much of that recommendation at all, and the only thing we could encourage you to do is to um, ask management to rewrite that sort of a recommendation in the future. I'm concerned that that resolution was subsequently taken by management, applied to a number of the things that happened, uh, interpreted, and, and it may be that the interpretation was genuine, but we just don't happen to agree with it. Um, there needed to be much greater clarity around what that recommendation was actually saying and what it was asking you to agree to. Interestingly, we've referred that recommendation out of interest to a number of people to see their reaction to it. Um, their reaction was like ours, um, basically regarded as nonsense. Now, all I could suggest in the future is um, you, you really do need to refer it back. The recommendations you receive need to be absolutely plain English. And if accountants, other accountants can't understand that, then it suggests to me that things aren't quite One of the reasons I'm a bit concerned about is we sought clarification through the review around a, a, a range of different things. We got a statement back like this as a clarification to one of our questions, and I scratched my head looking and thinking, well, here we go again. So I just encourage you to, around the general thing of reporting, make sure that if you're receiving reports and receiving recommendations, if you don't understand it, seek to have it changed, because it, I, I'd have to say it's not necessarily your ability to understand it or not. Uh, the difficulties you might have had yourselves are shared by others, and, and we shared it as well. So. Um, confidentiality provision, second to last bullet point on page 53. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a quandary really, for Council to try to uh, manage its obligations around commercial contracts, while at the same time trying to make sure that um, this Council, in terms of reporting from management, and the public, or the ratepayers, um, understand what's going on. There's been significant use of public excluded around this event. Some of it was necessary for sure. But I think our encouragement would, to you would be to um, maybe continue to challenge that, that concept because we just felt that the end result of it was that not only the public and the media, but also yourselves ended up with poorer information than you, any of you should have had. And, and I think you know, we're not trying. There's no particular criticism of anyone around this, but I, I just think this whole business of what can be shared in an open forum and what can be shared in, in, in public excluded, uh, does need to be constantly reviewed because I think it's unfortunate what happened around knowledge of the, the costs, for example, of this event. That was that's one example. So um, my final comment here relates to whether or not this event, um, the V8 event, had been the subject of any previous review. It hadn't. It's our understanding that, in fact, there was some discouragement to include it in um, the internal audit program, for example. Um, I, we don't think that's right. Uh, I, we believe that any major project should be considered in terms of an internal audit um, program of work. It may well be that the internal auditor can't personally do the review, whether it's a skills thing or whether it's a capacity thing, but it's not to say that uh, that person couldn't facilitate or arrange for somebody else to do a review. On the other hand, the chief executive might just choose to do it himself. It doesn't, it's not the absolute domain of the internal auditor. But all, all we'd really say is um, around major activities, major projects, do consider, because I think there's a lot of value to organisations, 
in some kind of periodic review and, and obtaining some lessons uh, to be learned from it. We've included a range of recommendations in our report that are at the front of it. Um, I, we really tried to um, draft those with a future-looking focus uh, because really that's the, the only value out of a substantially retrospective review like this. Um, I've concluded in, uh, well, we've, in, the, in page 53 here, just at the end of our um, conclusions, we've just made a statement here that seven years, it's a long period of time. Um, I don't think everyone has been able to accurately recall some of the things that happened. Uh, I guess, the, at least to some extent, we, there was a, we received some advice that was a little bit inconsistent. But I think what was evident was just the passage of time has made that difficult. Um, documentation for us was a key thing. Uh, we clearly had to try to put a bit more reliance on the documentation because of it. But nevertheless, um, we appreciated, um, I'm not sure I'm going to say in every instance, but we appreciate a lot of the, um, the comments, the advice, the support we received. Um, from the management team here and from all of you who we interviewed and others. Um, I mean, without that kind of assistance and, and willingness to be open about things, it would obviously have made the review very difficult. So that's where I guess I'd conclude my um, run through the report. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, councillors, we've agreed to finish at 5.30, so are there any further questions? Yes, Councillor O'Leary. I had a question just on that um, second-to-last bullet point um, about the significant use of confidentiality provisions, etc. I just, um, with the leave of the Chair, I just wanted to ask you around that comment, because you're making recommendations to us, um, that recently this council was put in a position of making a decision um, was public excluded, so I can't go into that. But it was um, the final decision on, on the V8. I was very critical of the process because I felt it was rushed. We were given the report, etc. Blah blah blah. Um, in your opinion, then one of the reasons we were given, one of the reasons was the confidentiality issues that you've raised, and, and I acknowledge and accept those. Um, another one was that we were dealing with a large commercial organisation and that we needed to behave similarly. Those are my words. Do you agree with that or do you think we are a government, we need to behave as a government and this as a commercial organisation, if that makes sense? Yeah. Your Worship, I, I think I understand the question well enough, but um, I don't think there's a simple answer to it. There's no doubt that with some of the commercial dealings you have, you will need to apply some confidentiality around those things. But I think that um, you also need to recognise that I guess some of those commercial operators will have their own reasons for wanting confidentiality. And they may not necessarily match what you need to do as a public sector organisation. So there's a tension there. And, and I can't tell you what the answer to that is. I can probably only suggest that you need to keep challenging that, that tension and, and understand what the bottom line is. I can see why the promoters in this instance would be sensitive about some aspects of the agreements, and that's OK. Um, but does that require sensitivity around the agreements in whole? And, and I'm just, in a sense, asking the question, I suppose. So there is a tension, there's a challenge there. Um, our, our conclusion around this, though, was that um, councillors generally didn't see any of the agreements signed up around these things, didn't get detailed summaries of what was in them. Um, our general feeling was that the, the information available both to council and the public was poorer than it needed to be. So that does suggest that the brakes have got to come off something and that uh, your public sector interests do need to come a bit further forward. Thank you. 
Any other questions, Councillor? You, you yeah. Worship, but the question more of process. Mm. I know there's been a general agreement we were going to finish at 5.30, mm. but I, I don't think any of us realised at that mm. stage that getting to where we're at would have only just occurred. And mm. I know Councillor Boss and others may have to go, but I, I, I wonder if we do finish now, mm. when will we have a chance uh, as an elected member as to respond mm -hmm. to the report. And I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to be chopped off at the pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if, if you'd be able mm -hmm. to... So um, you mentioned before about bringing back a summary. Is that well, right? there's two aspects to this, Your Worship. One is a longer-term one, which is um, taking some time to, to reflect mm -hmm. on the recommendations and the findings and for me to bring back a report for further consideration. But And, and I'd envisage taking some time to do that properly. I think what you're raising is the ability to have further commentary around mm -hmm. the, the findings mm -hmm. and whether or not, if we're not able to do that tonight, whether there will be a, an opportunity at a subsequent um, uh, council meeting. Can I ask you, when, when do you think you will have that um, summary <coughs> available? Because I, I'm thinking that that would be the time when we would then, um, having reread the report, I guess, and had an opportunity to reflect on it, that we would then debate the report. So you, when, when do you think that will be? Um, because um, sooner rather than later, I guess. You, you wish to, I just add, I add a mm. limb to, to mm. the general debate. Um, mm. Now that, and rightly so, we've made the decision that this report is now out in the open, uh, it is reasonable, I think, for the media to want to get comments uh, from a number of people, including uh, elected current elected members. Um, uh, we, of course... Uh, have to be very careful of, of making comments um, outside of the debating chamber. And uh, I just reiterate my reluctance mm -hmm. to have had the ability to respond to this report mm -hmm. uh, taken away from me in an environment where I have uh, qualified privilege. Mm -hmm. um, and I just raise that as I think mm -hmm. uh, it would be unfortunate if you were to... Uh, choose to terminate the meeting early. Uh, I accept some have to go, in which case they should go, and, but you should let us at least have uh, an ability to make comment. Well, I think, though, um, Councillor Wilson, we did agree that we would finish at 5.30, and we, we have been here all day. Um, time is upon us, I accept that, but at the end of the day, it's been a very useful afternoon, and we've worked through it. Uh, and, and our presenters have been helpful in that regard. Um, I don't think that you're missing out on any opportunity at all to comment on the substance of the report or for any of the councillors to debate the report if we come back another day. Well, you wish it just um, for so process. Just, I intend just, to move a motion that just, we continue. If I have a seconder, we can make a formal decision. Of course, we've yet hmm. to decide... We've had a general chat that isn't a resolution of this council, um, and with all due respect, uh, that should be deemed by the council on a formal, formal agreement. So uh, just indicate so, so my Councillor intention Wilson, to move the motion. If you'd just like to let me finish, and then I'm very happy to entertain your motion. So what I was saying um, before I was interrupted by you was that we have had a long day, and certainly I don't accept that councillors are in any way being... Um, stymied in their ability to debate the report at all. And in fact, I think it's quite important that we do have that opportunity to do that. The question here is, we've had a long day. It's 5.30. We agreed to a time of finishing at 5.30. And for me, it's about working out when we will come back to have that adequate debate. Now, I sought guidance from the CE because he earlier indicated to us that he wanted to review the report and come back to us with his recommendations on what is in this report, and I think that's actually a very important part of this process as well, and that's picking up on some of the comments of councillors about learning experience, particularly Councillor Gallagher's made mention of that several times, and our presenters today have also made mention of that. What I was seeking from the CE was a time frame on that, and I have said, as you've just heard me say, the sooner the better. Um, so if you'd just like to hold on, I will seek from the CE when is that likely to be, because... I agree with Councillor Wilson on one point. This is a very topical issue in the public domain, no doubt about that. Um, but it is a lengthy, comprehensive report, um, and I think that we need to give it the due consideration 
um, given the tenor of what we've discussed this afternoon, um, that it does deserve. So when, um, CE, do you think you'll be able to do that and come back to it? Thank you, Your Worship. I'm making a judgment here. I, I think we'd need probably a week to uh, reflect on this and come back with some, mm. some concrete uh, uh, responses that I'd be recommending from Council. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the next question would be, given a week uh, and given our, our commitments over the next period of time around LTP meetings, mm. I guess the only, and, and I'm doing this on the hoof, mm. uh, whether we uh, find some time in amongst those meetings that we have mm. Uh, scheduled around our long-term plan. Um, I can't be any more specific than that. Yes, so can I just seek guidance from um, Mr Dick? We have, um, next week, we have a meeting on Monday, and we've, what other days have we meetings? We, we've got uh, already scheduled Monday 31st. Yes. Um, the, given the following week is freer, but I could work with the Chief Executive on some dates. So next week we just have Monday allocated, do we? Uh, currently we do. Yeah. Good evening next week. Yeah. Okay. So Nothing on Friday the 4th. Friday the 4th. Is there time available on Friday the 4th? Yeah, I, I would have to check. Right. Your worship on okay, that. so what, I'm, what, what I think the um, process, and, and again, Councillor Wilson can put his motion, but I, just so that we're clear on, on perhaps what a process board can be, um, that the CE has a week and that in the first council meeting in the following week, we allocate time um, for debate on this report and to hear from the CE on his recommendations. So we would put that on to an existing meeting date as part of our 10-year planning process. That way we don't have to find another meeting date and we can simply add it into that. And it would be the first up item so that we ensure that we do deal with it. Um, so that would that, that's a solution for today. So, Councillor Wilson, you did want to move a motion? Your Worship, my motion would simply be that we continue for another hour <coughs> to, uh, and if I can have a seconder, I'll, I'll speak to it, but if, it, if it, I don't have a seconder, I'll... Have a second. Okay. There's a seconder second. from Councillor Gallagher. Uh, Your Worship, the, um, I acknowledge there was general discussion uh, about the time frame for today. Uh, and I think it was on the proviso. We weren't quite sure how long the process was going to take. And where I do agree with you is that the, um, uh, our friends from Wellington have presented very well and we appreciate all of, all of what they've done. But I think it's timely to enable us as a council uh, to respond to what we've seen. And I draw a slight distinction from what the CEO may now go off and do, which is a pursuit of whether or not uh, council or his management recommendation is for us to pursue uh, actions that fall out of the report. I'm wanting the opportunity to respond to the content of the report as I see it. Um, and I feel that uh, the public should be entitled to that. Uh, I note uh, that um, this issue has overwhelmed the balance of our normal council uh, uh, agenda. So I guess in our planning processes moving forward, we have to be mindful of that. Uh, and as such, uh, I feel investing another hour to enable us to um, voice our opinions is an appropriate mechanism um, that I accept. Um, some may choose uh, not to want to do that, and I think that would be disappointing. Thank you, Councillor Sun. Now, um, Councillor Gallagher, you seconded that motion. Did you want to speak to it? I'll reserve my uh, okay. right of comment. I've got Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I won't be supporting um, the motion, but it's actually uh, under the same premise. I actually do want proper time to consider the report. We did speed read it this afternoon, and I managed somehow to get through it all. But I really want to to make my comments and debate um, under the principle of why we ask for this audit. And that's, I want to see the CE's recommendations on how we move forward and what processes we're going to put in place to better the organisation, to better council and to better our decision making. So uh, for me that's the logical next step. So I'm comfortable with, um, with that process when, that's, when that meeting's going to pop up. Thank you. Councillor McPherson? Yes, Your Worship. I support and agree with Councillor Leary's comments and your own for about the proper time to do this. Uh, I would love to be able to debate the 
year, and I'm sure I can say just as late as Councillor Wilson <laughs> making it, Same. but I don't think it'll be very productive. <laughs> um, apart from the fact that we've we've all just been read it, and we have, we've all missed points, I guarantee you that are in here. Um, not everyone will have the opportunity to participate fully in 45 minutes that we have, have left, even under Councillor Wilson's time. And as you know, people are already delaying going to other meetings. So I think it's much more sensible to do it speedily, like you've suggested, so we can actually have a proper debate and fair opportunity for everyone to participate, not just the first in, which will be how it is, I suggest. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gowan? You think you also oppose the motion? Uh, there's a lot in this report. We've only just received it, like uh, members of the public here, probably we've had another half an hour or so more than that. And what I don't want to see is that in another three quarters of an hour, an hour's time, there's only three or four sitting around the table here, other people are rushing off, and this is too important. The whole of the council should be debating this, but in a considered way, after I've had time to read it again. So I completely oppose the motion. Thank you. I'm Deputy Mayor. Yes, thanks, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I do want time to consider this report and what you've suggested is the common sense way to do it. There is nothing to stop Councillor Wilson talking to the media in five minutes and nor Councillor Gallagher if they choose that option for themselves. The media will be talking to each of us, I guess, and so there's that individual opportunity immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Councillor Gallagher, did you want to speak? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Just clarification, when did you anticipate that we would sit again on this issue? Um, about about a week. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Not me. I, what I indicated <laughs> is that we would need a week. We would need next week to, mm -hmm. to pull something uh, worthwhile together. There are legal issues and a bunch of other things. And that we would need to find something the following week. So it would be we week commencing the 7th of November. Yes, well, 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 I would argue, and supporting that Councillor Wilson that uh, this stating the obvious is one of the most important issues in the recent history of this city and it is totally inappropriate and inadequate in terms of the right of public discussion and public debate certainly on behalf of the councillors that the people of this city have elected to do a job uh, to, to wait a, a week. I would have thought that we could have held this over at least uh, to um, Monday I would have thought that this item would have had precedence over the business that we were due to discuss on Monday. That is an LTP, that is a 10-year plan. I would have thought we could have rescheduled some of that agenda. And I think that the best place uh, to have a public debate and a public discussion by the people who have been elected by this city to do a job is not one-on-one -on -one, uh, chats uh, to reporters. Uh, it is by uh, this council reconvening on this most important and vital matter to have a public, full public discussion on this issue. And I would certainly, at the very least, um, uh, would ask the Mayor to seriously consider, or the Chief Executive, to see if um, Monday was the um, appropriate time. I am also aware that I want to have a full, thorough public discussion around the governance issue. I publicly acknowledge in terms of comment about management there are some natural justice issues and in that I am closely guided by the city solicitor but I am very, very keen for this body, this elected council to have a discussion around the governance issues in public forum, in public session as soon as practically possible. Yeah. I'm, su I'm supporting. Well, actually, I would, I'm not able to move an amendment because I second the original amendment. I'm hearing that uh, from around this table there is not an appetite to carry on this evening on this most important issue. I have asked a question to the chair of this meeting and to the chief executive whether, in fact, it would be practical or we could look at uh, adjourning this meeting at this time. I can't move that because I've seconded this motion uh, and that possibly we could carry on this discussion on Monday. Um, so as I understand it, sir, you are saying you need a longer time yes. to review it. Okay, so the position you heard, Councillor Gallagher, was it is the Chief Executive who is saying he needs the time well, to read no. the report for the recommendations, hence Can Monday I... being unacceptable to, to him. Sure. Thank you, Your Worship. Mm -hmm. This is not an issue of the Chief Executive reviewing this report. I think there are already, let us acknowledge, there are some very, very positive uh, 
actions coming out of this, of, of this report already in terms of the processes. So let me acknowledge that. That is a separate issue to a public discussion and public debate by the elected members of this city on what is a very, very important report, acknowledging, of course, natural justice issues. Oh, thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? Okay, I just wanted to add, councillors, that one of the very important things that this report highlights is information and the ability to assess it, digest it, read it, analyse it. Yeah. And in order to do that, I'm saying I need a bit more time. I want to read this again carefully. I want to have a very good debate about this issue too, but I want to be informed, well informed, to be able to have that debate. And I think uh, a week's delay in doing that does not take away at all the ability to debate this. In fact, I think it enhances it because councillors will feel more comfortable that they fully understand and uh, have analysed what's in the report. So I think it actually adds to the debate rather than taking it away. It's unfortunate we've run out of time today. I acknowledge that. Um, but good debaters also about, you know, freshness and not having sat here all day um, waiting our way through this. And I think that's another point that shouldn't be lost. Um, so I think, um, Councillor Wilson, you did just, use the motion, so you yeah, do have just, to write Just my right of reply, Your Worship. Um, just to reiterate again, uh, I draw a distinction from what we are expecting the CEO to come back to us with, which is, again, um, after doing a full analysis of the report to see whether or not this council should be taking some steps, uh, and we have a broad range of potential steps um, to uh, address some of the concerns raised um, uh, by the report. Uh, I feel, uh, and what I'm concerned about, is the fact that we are being denied in this chamber the ability to immediately respond to a report that lays a great deal of criticism, uh, but also con some constructive critique, uh, and I would have liked that opportunity. But I am absolutely delighted, absolutely delighted, can't express it more enthusiastically, that Her Worship is now uh, feeling that it's absolutely essential that we have more time to read and digest uh, these critical pieces of information because it goes to the heart of democracy. I wonder, I wonder where that vigour was a week or so ago when I asked this, uh, this chamber to delay a week on a critical decision of the V8, a critical decision of the V8 worth millions of dollars and her worship said, no, 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 we're more than capable of making a decision right away. But I'm delighted, your worship, that you've had a change of heart. And this is a new precedent that you're setting, that, the, that we will have time and we'll have the ability to digest, to make good decisions. Because I am more than comfortable that I'll be able to raise my concerns that I would have today in a week's time. And I would have simply have liked to have had that opportunity a couple of weeks ago that I was denied. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Your Worship, I think that we're all getting tired now listening to the debate. I haven't participated, but I agree with the sentiment of a bit extra time that Councillor Wilson Thank you, Councillor Henebury. All right, so we have a motion on the table, no. Councillor. So um, I think we'll go to the board. I'm delighted about the motion. This, this is to carry on, could, Councillor Henebury. Sorry, could you, could you Just repeat the, mo the motion. Yes. So, so um, just that the motion is that we continue to debate for another hour. An additional one hour. Yep. An additional one hour. Mm -hmm. Lost to worship, 3-9. Okay, thank you. Um, so, councillors, um, in terms of the meeting today, um, just, just to clarify, we're going to come back to this matter um, the week after next at the first meeting in our 10-year plan process, and that'll be the first item. Um, and um, we are now going, just before I close the meeting, I want to thank you very much for your attendance today and uh, for your contribution. Um, it's been really valuable. So thank you very much for coming and thank you to um, the solicitor as well for being here. So I'm now going to um, officially close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.